Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the Burning Ice Tech channel. Today's topic is Azure Storage Services. Now within the Microsoft Azure Storage Services, the topics we're going to be taking a look at today is as follow. Blob Storage, File Storage, Queue Storage, Table Storage, and lastly, Disk Storage. Now, before we can actually go ahead and talk about these services, we need to just quickly take a look at the general classification of the types of storage we actually get. And that is as follow. We have actually have different data categories for this. The first one being structured data, semi-structured data, and then lastly, the third one here being unstructured data. So this is a general classification for the types of data we're gonna be using. Okay, let's dive in and take a look at the first one being structured data. Now, structured data is actually a very simple one. In a nutshell, structured data is when your data is organized so well that you can describe it using specific schema. So for each table, each row of the table, you can define what are the properties of each row, what are the type of those properties, and each row that you insert into that table has to follow the schema. Additionally, if you have multiple tables, you can define relationships between those tables. This is a scenario that you'll typically see in a relational databases. All right, now the second type of data that we have here on our list is semi-structured data. Now with semi-structured, you still have a table, but each row within this table does not need to follow any specific schema, unlike what we saw with structured data just a moment ago. This means each row can have its own unique properties. The only common property is usually some sort of key, like an ID column. So you can say this is a less formal way of storing data. And then lastly, our last item on this little list here of data sorts is unstructured data. This can be data like PDF files, PNG files, MP4s, AVI, EXE, TXT, and many more. These are files that do not follow structure, which represents pretty much any kind of data if you think about it. This brings us to our next topic, which is Azure Blob Storage. Now, just a moment ago with the previous topic, we were talking about this unstructured data. Well, any kind of unstructured data can be called blob. The word blob is actually an abbreviation, which stands for binary large object. So it is basically any kind of file. And you can put those blobs into Azure blob storage into something called container. The container is, in a nutshell, just a holder for multiple blobs. You can also have more than one container within an Azure blob storage. It is designed to allow both applications and users who work with unstructured files in the cloud. So Azure blob storage is simply a service designed to store any kind of file in Azure. Now, another characteristic of blob storage is there are free storage tiers. The storage tiers allow Microsoft to provide you with better performance and pricing depending on how often you actually access this data. Generally, the more often you access the data, the higher the performance you want. This usually tends to also cost you more though. I mean, obviously, if you're going to be accessing data more, you, you're going to want a lot of performance. And if you want performance, that's generally going to cost you more. So if you want to access less often, you can reduce the performance, which will also in turn reduce the amount you pay. So when it comes to free tiers of Microsoft, the first one is called hot. This is used for data you access very frequently. Um, if you, for example, have a web application that needs to serve images and any other form of data to your customer that will need to um, access at very fast speeds, then this is probably going to be the best suited tier for your specific scenario. The hot storage option will give you the fastest performance for your files. It is obviously also going to probably cost you the most due to that fast performance. If that same solution of yours or any other solution of yours has files that are accessed less frequently, that's the keyword here, less frequently, then you rather opt for the second option, which is referred to as cool storage. If with the cool tier, you're going to be getting lower availability, but higher durability. Okay, so obviously if you're gonna be paying less, you're gonna get less speed here, that's what's gonna happen. This is going to be reduced performance, but will in turn give you a significant discount on the price you're paying here. 
Um, and the third one is obviously going to be the same, which we're going to get to in a moment. So you can use this cool storage, for example, backups maybe, or any form of data that you're not going to access that regularly, maybe an old version of your application. The last one we have here out of the three tiers is called Archive. This is generally used for very long-term storage. So this could very well be data of some kind that you might end up never even accessing at some point. So if you are going to be accessing it, it's, it's going to be extremely, extremely rare. rare. Um, it's actually very unlikely you're going to ever even access that data. So considering that you're never going to access that data, you can afford to sacrifice speed. I mean, it goes without saying of the third option, you're going to be sacrificing massive availability here. Uh, it's going to be extremely slow. It could very well take you hours to go and retrieve that data. Um, but this is the lowest, lowest price you could possibly pay with the third option. So hot, that one, you're going to be paying the most, but it's going to give you the best performance. So if you've got any files, anything like that, it needs to be given to your users, your clients at lightning speeds, hot is the one you need to go and use. So if you've got some sort of web application, that's the one. Any files that's going to be accessed less frequently, like a normal backup or an old version of a program or just whatever, that's going to be a cool storage. Lower price, lower uh, lower availability, lower speed, obviously, as well, in turn. And the last one where we just mentioned archive being the slowest out of the lot, but also the cheapest out of the lot here. Uh, I mean, that really, really is the lowest price Microsoft's going to give you per gigabyte. Um, you're not going to get anything cheaper than that. So that pretty much is blob storage, which brings us to our next topic, which is Azure file storage. Now, file storage, I'm going to start things off by using the same drawing that I initially did with blob storage. Uh, blob storage and file storage are actually very similar to one another, very, very much the same. Uh, with blob storage, the word blob is actually a synonym for the word file. Um, and as we've seen, there's pretty much any kind of file, you know, when it comes to blob storage. Okay, so if they are so much alike, blob storage and file storage, what exactly is the difference between blob storage and file storage? I'm going to start off with the semantic differences. In file storage, instead of blob storage, we store files. Instead of containers, we have shares. And then also instead of blob storage, we have file storage. As you can see, semantically, they are very much the same, these two, which is why I'm explaining them right after one another, you know, just to make it easy for you guys to follow. So I'm on purposely explaining file storage right after blob storage. They look and work the same for the most part, but the difference is the way you access the data is a slight different. So looking the same, working the same, is just the way you access the data is going to be tad different. For file storage, you usually access your file storage via SMB protocol. So this is a simple file share service. This is the same as when you go create yourself a good old fashioned map drive. Normally when you go to File Explorer on your PC, specifically a location called My PC or This PC, I think it's called This PC on Windows 10, depending on which operating system you're actually using, you'll have the ability to go and create what we call a map drive or a network drive. You know, Some people call it a map drive, some people call it a network drive. Now, when you go and create yourself a map drive, that is generally location somewhere else, usually on a server. It's probably going to be in the same building. So if you are at the office and you go map a drive, that drive is probably going to be on a server. It's usually a folder on a server, and that server is somewhere in your office. Now, file storage in Azure is very much the same as a map drive. You can actually go and map it, mind you. So you can go and map that, and instead of that folder or that, that map destination being somewhere on one of your servers on premises, it's going to be on a server in the cloud now. So that's the only real difference here is instead of that location being in, on premises on one of your servers, it's not just going to be in the cloud. So you're still going to be able to go and map that and all that. It's just the way you access your data. Okay, so that is pretty much file storage. Now, all that's left to do is just to discuss the characteristics of file storage. Okay, so the first thing is it's obviously a service that allows you to store files. We've established that much. So files that will be accessed through shared drive protocols, however. There are common scenarios that this service was designed for. Um, the first being an extension of on-premises file shares. You know, any existing file shares that you currently have on-premises, it's basically just going to go and build on top of that. So if your company or your client's company currently already has existing file shares on-premises, and let's say hypothetically speaking, they're just running low on space and they just want to go and add more space. 
What they can go and do is they can use Azure's file storage and just add on to the existing space they have on premises. I mean, how sweet is that? So, I mean, file storage in the cloud, we've just established is pretty much exactly the same as having a file server or normal storage on premises. So you can actually go you with that in mind and add the cloud file storage on top of your existing file storage on premises. And that's going to basically boost you, so to speak. So this gives them more storage in a nutshell. The second scenario is when people would like to use file storage as a lift and shift. So that's what we normally call it as a lift and shift. This is basically when your company already has existing applications and stuff. And what they basically want to go and do is they want to try somehow to get these applications in the cloud. Or at the very least, where they get stored, all that kinds of jazz. That needs to be stored in the cloud. Now, generally speaking, to be able to go and store your applications in the cloud now that you currently have on-premises, you're going to have to go through the whole big hassle of having to redesign those applications to be compatible with blob storage in the cloud. Now, to avoid having to go through all of that you know, painstaking process of redesigning your applications, all that, you can take advantage of file storage. You don't need to go and redesign your applications on premises then. All you go and do is you just go and get yourself file storage. You can go map it as a drive and those applications that you have, you just simply just point them to that map drive now. So inherently, you know, they're just compatible. They're natively compatible of one another, these things. So that's going to save you a tremendous amount of inconvenience, you know, having to go and redesign your applications, all that. If you're going to go and create yourself a bunch of new applications, you might as well off the bat just go and use blob storage. But if you're sitting with a situation of having an existing applications on premises, you might want to go for file storage instead because it's pretty much the same as a blob storage. Just go for file storage. It's going to save you the headache of having to go and redesign those applications. Okay, so yeah, that pretty much is Azure's file storage in a nutshell, guys. So let's move on to our next topic. Our next topic is Azure's queue storage. This is a very small and simple service, but yet important when building applications. When you have an application that has several tasks that needs to be completed, and you know each of these might take some time to complete, what you can do is output those into Azure's queue as separate messages. This will allow background processes and other services to take those messages from the queue at their own pace and let them process those asynchronously. This will not only offload your front-end application, but also allow you to pick more suited services for the background processing. Okay, so to summarize some of the characteristics of queue storage, the Azure queue storage is a service that allows you to store small pieces of data, which you can refer to as messages, I guess. This is so that you can build scalable asynchronous processing solutions in Azure. This is queue storage in a nutshell, guys, which basically leaves us with our next topic. Our next topic is Azure's table storage. This service was designed with semi-structured data in mind so that both users and applications can output the semi-structured data form into tables. This table, along with other possible tables, are part of table storage. Since table storage is just like a database, it goes without saying that you can have more than one table. In a database, you can store multiple tables within your data. Just keep in mind that this is a semi-structured database, so there are no drawings or schemas. It's just your data in simple storage. These databases are also called NoSQL databases. Okay, so to summarize some of the table characteristics, Azure's table storage is one of the storage services for your semi-structured data needs. You can work, insert, update, and operate on the data in a structured form. You use this type of database when you don't need stuff like foreign joins, foreign keys, relationships, or when you don't need to follow a strict schema. This is a service also additionally designed for fast access. If you find yourself storing tremendous amounts of data like petabytes, then, well, you'll have access to this data within milliseconds if you go and use yourself a compound key um, to access the data in those specific rows. Similarly to blob storage, Microsoft provides programming interfaces and also many SDKs, so it'll be very easy for developers to go and use this table storage when building solutions for your Azure environment. All right, guys, so that pretty much is table storage in a nutshell, which brings us to our last topic today, which is Azure's disk storage. Now, of normal Windows virtual machines, you might have seen by now that you sometimes have multiple partitions that can be stored on one or multiple disks. Now, when it comes to Azure, this is simply just done via disk storage service. It's very much the same as what you would have on premises with your traditional Windows virtual machines. 
These normally run on Hyper-V if we're talking about Microsoft. Now, if you take a look at the characteristics of Azure Disk Storage, it's a disk emulation in the cloud, much like what you would see with Hyper-V on-premises. Um, I'm using Microsoft examples today, but it's not probably not just limited to Microsoft. It allows users or customers to attach a persistent storage for their virtual machine, both for operating systems and their application data. The disks in Azure come with different sizes and different types, as well as different tiers. So you can normally easily access this by just going to virtual machines on the Azure portal and going to disks on the virtual machine blade. Alternatively, you can also access this while creating a virtual machine on the disk section. The disks are mostly hot swappable though, so you don't need to turn off a virtual machine even to be able to go and add additional storage. I mean, how cool is that? It's always such a slip to have to go and turn a virtual machine off to first to go and add additional storage. Now you don't have to go and do that. You just need to remember to go and click on the save button, otherwise it will not apply. Honestly speaking, guys, I cannot tell you how many times I've forgotten to click on the save button. Um, I will go create storage, I'll add it to the virtual machine, I just don't click on storage, or I just don't click on save. And then eventually when I go into the virtual machine, I find myself wondering where is this additional storage that I just created. And then it's simply a matter of me not clicking on save, which means it did never actually apply to the virtual machine. So it's very crucial that you guys actually remember to go click on the save button. Um, something important to keep in mind when playing with these disks, when you add them to a virtual machine, the bigger the disk and the higher the performance, like usual, the price is also going to go up higher and higher. I mean, you always get what you pay for. So the more you get, the more you pay. Lastly, guys, disk storage allows users or customers to store the disk in unmanaged or managed form, which is a very nice option to have. Um, depending on how much control you want over your disk and which benefits you want, you'll either choose the one or the other. All right, guys, so that concludes our last form of storage today, being disk storage. It concludes the storage services topic in general for today. I hope this has been informative for you guys. I hope you guys have learned something. If you have, please click on the like button. If you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing if you've not done so already. Otherwise, you're not going to know when the new episode comes out or if I go and release a new one like usual. And thanks, guys, for watching. I will see you on the next episode, being episode 11. Bye, guys. Let me. Hey. Mm -hmm.